Hello everyone and welcome to the channel. I'm Emmanuel, I'm a Boeing 737 pilot and today we are going to go back to the basics and to the Piper 28 to do a little bit of IFR training flying. Now I aim to do pretty much everything the raw data today and I do have to say this is quite a spontaneous idea of what we're doing today so I've actually prepared pretty much nothing. But that's gonna make things a little bit more interesting over here because it means that it will be a bit harder for me as well. Also, do note that the controllers we have on Batsum today are pretty much all brand new trainees. So they are also still learning, so that's the environment in which we are going to operate today. Pretty much a complete learning environment for everybody of us. So hello to everybody who has just joined up here in the chat. Now, let's have a quick look into what we are going to do today. And the most important thing that we have is, of course, today our Navigraph charts. So, this is the first route of flight that we are going to do from Paderborn Lippstadt Airport with a standard instrument departure to Hamm and then on to Domek. And then finally, we will fly a Domek arrival for a standard ILS approach at Dortmund. At least that is the plan. We'll have to see what is actually going to happen. Now, this is the departure chart, and I do expect that we are using Rome 24 today, so straight at 2.4 miles, right turn in Mount Hum. Sounds like an easy arrival and departure, but let's see what is actually going to wait for us. So, let's head right into the airplane, and let's get this thing flying. So, been a while since I've flown the Piper 28, but uh, let's get straight there. So, pre-flight checklist. Landing gear lever. That is hidden down here. Down. Park and brake. Set. Avionics. Off. Mixture. Idle cutoff. Magnetos. Off. So, battery master on fuel gauges check the quantity we have full fuel tanks today enunciator panel checked battery master switch off primary flight controls let's check that the controls are actually working as they should and they do Okay, flaps. Checked, trims, neutral, and the baggage door is closed. Pre-flight checklist complete. Then before starting engines checklist. Park and brake set, circuit breakers. Yeah, hidden down here. Make sure that there is nothing popped down here and they're all in. Alternate air off. It's up here and it's in the closed position. Propeller levers, full forward, avionics, off and fuel selector. We're going to start with the left tank today before starting engine checklist complete. Okay, before we can start up though, since we are going to fly IFR, we actually have to get our IFR clearance. And we can find Paderborn Tower on frequency 133.375 and the 8 is on 125.75. Oh, Okay, we've heard that already. Then let's call tower. Paramount Tower, 
Command Tower Low, Delta Echo Echo Mike in your information, Echo Request Startup and Clearance. Delta Echo Echo Mike India, startup approved, clear Dortmund, Hum 8 Whiskey departure, fly pledge route, climb 5000 feet, squawk 1000. We call you for taxi, Delta Echo Echo Mike India. Okay, that looks to me like he is pretty much ready. And we are just going to leave the nav radios untuned as they are over here because the thing that we do um, want to do is the raw data training. Okay, so. Can we actually switch the uh, GTN off? Oh, doesn't look like it. Okay. Well, if that's what it is, then okay. So, cold engine start checklist. Throttles, half an inch open, alternator on, battery on, fuel pump low or use primer. Well, we're going to use low today. Then mixture, rich, fuel pressure is observed, and then idle cutoff. Okay, then left is clear, right is clear, clear prop. And we have a good start. only we could actually hear the thing. Is it just on my computer that it is so quiet? That's better. Okay, so throttle 1400 to 1500 RPMs. Oil pressure check. The oil press is on the left over here. And the throttle between 14 and 1500 that's the engine start checklist complete. Okay, so transponder on. Com2 can go to the guard frequency then. And monitoring. DME on. Now let's actually set the airplane up for our taxi. And for that, we have the Hum 8 Whiskey departure as cleared by our traffic control. And for that, Go straight at on a 235 degree track until 2.4 dME Papa of a Delta, and that is over here, Paderborn Lipstadt DME 108.5. So let's tune that in the DME 108.5. And thereafter, it's going to be a right hand turn, radial 117 in Mount Ham. So that's going to be 115 decimal 6. Five zero, and that'll go active. And then finally, we're going to tune our backup one zero eight point five in the um, down here in the um, standby radio. Okay. So with that, we are pretty much ready to go. Takeoff briefing then. This is going to be a left seat takeoff on runway two four. Flaps up, rotate at seventy five, climb at one hundred, and. Um, we are, for any more function on the runway, we are going to reject the takeoff. In case of an engine failure after liftoff, we're going to proceed on the runway heading, climbing to an altitude, um, whatever we can. Now, there are not going to be any immediate returns below an altitude of 1000 feet AGL. So, no immediate return below, um, let's make that 1800 on the altimeters. 
Above 1800 we can make an immediate return if we have to. Departure straight at 2.40 mi Papa Alpha Delta right turn in Mount Ham VOR climbing altitude 5000 feet which is going to be our cruising altitude as well. Any questions on the departure briefing? No, okay. Delta Echo Echo Mike India, request taxi. Delta Echo Echo Mike India, taxi to holding point runway 24 via Alpha. Taxi holding point runway 24 via Alpha, Delta Echo Echo Mike India. Okay, that's going to be a right turn out. Alpha, 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 all the way to the full length for our departure. And the brake is off. And we are clear on the right. This, by the way, is pretty much how I learned to fly IFR. Around these airports, um, Paderborn, Dortmund, Münster, Cologne, that is where my flight school did the um, practical IFR trainings. And we did use PA-28s for that, even though we had the PA-28 um, alphas and not the um, ones with the retractable gear as we are flying today. But I thought, if we are already flying something fancy, then um, let's get a fancy aircraft as well. So I chose, so I've chosen the uh, Turbo Arrow for today's flight. Okay, that's going to be Alpha next to the left. then we'll go all the way full length. So next up for the departure we need 297 on the radial down here. Okay, 297 pre-selected. Delta Echo Echo Mike India, wind 260 degrees, 14 knots, gusting 25 knots, runway 24 cleared for takeoff. Delta Echo Echo Mike India, runway 24 cleared for takeoff and we need a minute for the run-up. Can we do that on the runway? Delta Echo Mike India, affirmative, the runway is yours. Delta Mike India, Roger, the runway is ours. And Romay 24, clear for takeoff. Thank you very much. See you next time. Okay, so we are clear on the left, clear on the approach. He said we can line up already, so we are going to do that. And then we'll do the run up when we are on the runway. Okay. So here we are, let's go ahead and do the run-up. So, bottom brake set, propellers full forward, mixture full forward, throttle 2000 RPMs. Oh, that's a bit much. I find it a little bit hard to set the RPMs precisely with those turbocharged aircraft, but here we go, 2000 RPMs, magnetos check, and the drop shall be a maximum of 175, so let's go right igniter, 
and this must not exceed 175 right now and it's just about exceeding it let's go back to both see if the um, throttle might not have been set correctly there Okay, we try that one more time. That looks better, 125 RPM drop. Back to both. And now the left one. Same thing, 125 RPM drop, that's perfect. Vacuum pump is uh, checked down here, 4.8 to 5.1, so that's just about 4.8, perfect. So, oil pressure checked, oil temperature checked, amperage checked, fuel pressure checked, and the rest is all looking good. Okay, so, prop exercise then full forward, and that's working. Okay, let's wait for the props to increase again. And when the props are full forward, we're going to check the alternate air. Oop, no, that's the mixture. Here we go, alternate air. Don't see any difference there, but I believe that's probably due to the um, simulator. Okay, fuel pumps off. Observe the fuel pressure, and then throttles retard. Make sure it survives idle, and then we can run the before takeoff checklist. Okay, that looks good to me. Before takeoff checklist. Battery master on, alternate sw alternator switch on, flood instruments. We've got the Romwe heading, we still have the NAV flag, but that's because we're out of range from the VOR. That is good enough for me. We actually get an indication here already, but that's probably from the GPS. Well, flight simulator. Okay, fuel selector is on the left tank. The left tank is full enough. The right tank is looking good as well. Engines, engine checks complete. Alternate air closed, mixture, full forward, props, full forward, flaps up, trims set and uh, controls free doors latched before takeoff check is complete heat it on transponder alt ready to go delta echo echo mic and yes now rolling oh cleared for takeoff straight at 2.4 miles and then the right turn onto the radial set to takeoff thrust Take a thrust set, indication is normal. Seventy five, rotate. One. Here we go. So, hit the brakes, positive climb, gear up. And slowly release the rudder, put the plane into the wind. Climb speed is 100 knots. That looks about perfect. Okay, we're climbing until 2.4 nautical miles, then we do the right hand turn. Okay, set climb power. Use some 35 inches. Twenty four hundred RPMs. And of course the plane starts um, descending straight away. I'm correcting a little bit to the right because we have some pretty strong winds up here. Uh, 
and then as per the chart we can leave the frequency on our own. Unfortunately there is no departure controller online at the moment, so we're going to do this on Unicom, but that is actually going to make our life quite a bit easier. 1.7 miles, we're looking for 2.4 up there. But we still don't receive the Humviewer, that is a little bit concerning here. We should be receiving this by now. Also up here, nothing. But NAV is selected, and interestingly enough, we have the information up here. There it comes. Perfect. Oh, 2.4 miles. We start the right hand turn. Do a standard rate one turn, as we can see on the turn coordinator down here. And I'm going to use something like a heading of 270 to intercept the radial up here. Okay, 297, let's just adjust this once more. Something like this. Okay, 500 to go. Let's climb a little bit higher. I want to see if we can get above the clouds here. Let's go to flight level 70. That's also going to make our descent planning a little bit more interesting, so I'm all in for that. But looking outside, it doesn't really look like we can actually go up outside the clouds, but for now we'll continue level 70, and then let's see. Okay, transition altitude, set standard. Standard set, passing 5-2. Okay, I have a feeling we're just about going to skim the tops over here. But we might be out after this little cloud here, so let's keep going for now. Also check the temperatures, showing just about zero degrees right now. Well, I'm gonna do a tiny left turn in order to avoid that cloud, to avoid some unnecessary icing. And if we take it exact, we're a tiny bit to the right of the radial anyway, so... That is okay. Okay, it looks good so far. Then keep an eye on the power. As you climb up to higher altitudes, your um, power is actually going to reduce in piston aircraft, unless you have a turbocharger. Now on this particular plane we do have a turbocharger, but the manifold pressure is still reducing with altitude. Now, if I'm totally honest with you, I should probably have read a little bit more of the manual before I actually start flying the just flight iteration of the plane over here. But the way I remember, or at least the way it was on the aircraft that I trained on that had a turbocharger, um, the manifold pressure did not actually reduce with altitude. But we'll talk about that a little bit later when we are up at the level. Okay, reaching 7-0. So we'll let the plane accelerate first and then we're going to reduce power. That just makes the flying bit of things a little bit easier. Okay, getting a little bit high now, but here we are. That looks okay. So let's set something like 30 inches 
2200 RPMs. I'm going to look the exact values up in a moment. Okay, make sure we get back to level 70, flying this by hand, while at the same time looking around this, the cockpit and uh, handling all the systems is not all that easy. And here we are. Okay, autopilot on, heading on. Then we can go to nav intercept. Be aware the autopilot in this plane does not have an altitude hold function. At least, if you take it realistic, it does not have one. Um, just flight did fake an altitude hold by pushing the button beneath the control column over here. But um, we don't want to cheat too much, do we? Okay, so reach our cruising altitude. So let's set 75% of uh, cruise power. And we're going to find all those tables in the um, manuals. So I've just about docked that one out on uh, my iPad, so don't worry if you don't see that um, here on the screen. And 75% is going to be... 2300 RPMs at uh, 35 inches, okay. Okay, let's put that autopilot off for now. So, 2300 inches, 35 RPMs, what's that? Uh, sorry, 35 inches, 2300 RPMs, so something like this. It's going to be our cruise power. And here we are, pretty much all established. Okay, so let's talk about a little bit of the basics of um, flying IFR with the steam gauges then. And we'll start by having a look into a couple of the gauges. Now, I'm sure that many of you are familiar with the basic readings of the speed indicator, but are you also familiar with that little white scale up here and the knob we have down here? Because that is something that I find people are not too accustomed to in flight simulation. And basically what we do there, we take the temperature, which is currently about minus five degrees-ish, and then we dial that in for the temperature scale up here to meet, to meet our altitude that we can dial in up here. So we said we have a temperature of minus five degrees centigrade. So we're going to take the 7,000 feet where we're currently at and dial that towards the minus five, which is going to be something like this. And now what we have basically just gotten is the white scale down here now reads our true airspeed. So we can see while we're doing about 148 indicated, our true airspeed is actually something like 162. That's making our calculation is quite a bit easier now because we can use the true airspeed that we have gotten in order to calculate our wind influence if we want to and in the absence of any ground speed reading we could also use that more or less as a calculation of the time to the uh, station that we're flying to. Now for us today we are going to use uh, 15.65 so let's tune that on the DME real quick here. And if we simply take our DME gauge up here, or then that makes our life a little bit easier. We have 24 miles to run. We're doing 118 knots over ground, which means that we have quite a strong headwind. And that means we have 12 minutes remaining to the VOR that we're currently flying towards. Okay, so then, um, 
The next instrument in our standard layout obviously is the attitude direction indicator and I don't think there is a lot that I can explain about this instrument that you would not be familiar with anyway. The same goes for the altimeter up here which is really standard altimeter. The only thing that is interesting for you to know is if you have an altimeter like this one which only has a scale in inches then one hectopascal equals 0.03 inches. In other words Let's say our traffic control is going to give us a Q&H of 1017. We can take our standard Q&H of uh, 1013, which equals 29.92 inches. Now, if we have a Q&H of 1017 and we know that 0.03 inches equal 1 hectopascal, then we have to add 4 times 0.03 inches, which is then um, 0.12. So 2992 plus 0.12 3005 is going to be our Q and H in uh, 1017 hectopascals. That's just a little bit of a calculation there that I do find really helpful to have in your mind when you're flying an airplane like this in your simulator because, well, I still have a feeling that either developers just don't implement a hectopascal scale at all, even though it is pretty much the standard except in the United States, or if they do implement one, or if they do implement the option to choose between inches and hectopascals, then it is often tied to the metric option in the Microsoft Flight Simulator unit selection. And since we really don't want to use metric units, well, take it or leave it, you'll have to do the calculations. The other two instruments that, or the other three instruments that are really interesting for us, of course, conclude the horizontal situation indicator. And the one important thing for us to keep in mind with the HSI is those dots that we have up here. Now, this works the same in any airplane, regardless if it's a 737 or if it's a Piper 28. Basically, full scale deflection on a VOR is going to equal 10 degrees of displacement. So every one of these dots equals 2 degrees displacement. And this comes in handy when we are later on going to fly the approach, but also when we are currently heading towards the VOR station. Because basically, let's just not have a look at the radial indication up here for a second, because that would be cheating. The one thing that is interesting for us here is that right now we can see that the needle is set to a course of um, around 297 degrees inbound to the station. Now 297 degrees inbound means that we are on a bearing of 297 and if you want to know the radial that you're on you always have to look at the bottom of the scale. So we are currently flying on a radial of about that is um, 1, 1, Seven, or at least the needle is set to a radial of 117. And with the 2 degree displacement to the left, we can say that while our bearing to the VOR currently reads 297, or rather while the needle reads 297, we know that we are actually offset 2 degrees to the left because the indicator is displaced to the left here. So the actual rate or the actual bearing that we're on is currently 295 and the actual radial is 115. We can tell that from the instrument and the displacement of the um, indicator that we have up here. Now, a quick look at the radial on the GPS, radial 115, that actually confirms our reading of the instrument. By the way, in case you're wondering why, why I'm constantly going up and down and up and down, that is really because I'm still hand flying the airplane and while hand flying is pretty easy when you're just looking outside, it does become quite difficult when you're zooming in close to the instruments. So my apologies for that. The other instrument that we should quickly look at before we start thinking about the approach is of course the turn coordinator. Basically, we're trying to keep the ball in the middle all the time by using the rudder. But the really important thing for us over here is those little markings over here. And they mark the standard turn, so basically the two minutes turn. 
When we are turning the plane, let's actually make a left turn right now. And when the turn coordinator, when the wings of the turn coordinator are aligned with the um, marking up here, we are going to do a two minute turn. Now, those turns are called a rate one turn, rate one turn. And basically all IFR maneuvers are to be flown at a rate one turn. Now, there is a quick formula that you can use to calculate your bank angle for a rate one turn. And that is true airspeed divided by 10 plus seven. So if you fly that speed, or sorry, if you fly that bank angle, then you are always going to do a rate one turn, even without looking at the turn coordinator. So let's do a little bit of mathematics. We've already calculated our true airspeed, which is reading 160 knots. Now, if we divide that by 10, we end up with 16 plus seven, giving us a bank angle of 23 degrees. So at 23 degrees angle of bank, we're going to fly a rate one turn. Let's actually check if this calculation is true. So, if you look at the turn coordinator, we're currently doing some 23 degrees angle of bank, and the turn coordinator shows us exactly the rate one turn that we were expecting to do. Now, I've said earlier on that when flying IFR, we should basically always do a rate one turn. And that is true. Now, the problem of course comes up, as you can see, that at 160 knots of true airspeed, we are already needing a bank of 23 degrees. Obviously, we should not bank more than 25 or a maximum of 30 degrees. And you would reach that at a true airspeed of 180 knots. And therefore, the guys making the laws and designing all the standard IFR procedures have at some point decided that if you fly more than 180 knots true airspeed, the standard IFR bank angle is 25 degrees. And that is what all the turns on your standard instrument departures are basically based on, up to an airspeed of 250 knots. There are a couple sits that do require tighter turns and they will usually have a speed restriction associated with them. Alright, so that's pretty much the um, bits of theory that we should be aware of as we are um, flying IFR on the steam gauges. Now, the next thing we could do is either a holding, but I want to defer that to a little bit later on, because while there is still air traffic control online here in Batsim, I still want to make another approach. And what we're going to do is we'll fly the airplane over to Dortmund, where there is currently still a tower online, and then we're going to do an approach at Dortmund. So let's have a look into the route that we filed first of all. And we're currently just short of Hamvioa up here. And the next thing that we'll do is the left hand turn towards Domek, and then from Domek we'll start the standard procedure. So Domek is on a radial 204 outbound Ham VOR at a distance of 10 nautical miles. And there would actually be a holding defined over at Domek as well, but that shall not be interesting for us at the moment. So radial 204, 10 nautical miles. Let's have a look into the arrival charts as well then. We have a Domek to Alpha arrival, which basically leads us from Domek down towards uh, Vicative UR, 108.65. So we can already pre-select this in the standby frequency up here. Now out of there, we are going to fly the standard ILS approach. I would expect ROM 824 to be in use, but why don't we listen to the ages? 125.130 is the real life frequency. So Vatsim is probably going to use 125.125, but let's find out. Expect ILS approach runway 24, runway 524, transition level 60, wind 240 degrees 169, visibility 7 kilometers cloud, US 1000 feet, scattered 1600 feet, broken 
4,800 feet. Temperature 11, 2.9 QNH1021 information box drop. Out attention. Departure frequency for all departing aircraft is Unicom on frequency 122 decimal 800. Information Fox Drive. Men report time 2020. Expect ILS approach runway 24, runway 524. Transition level 60. Wind 240 degrees 169. Visibility 7 kilometers cloud. You at 1000 feet. Scattered 1600 feet. Broken 4800 feet. Temperature 11. 2.9 QNH1021. Information Fox Drive. Out of tension. Okay, so information Foxtrot, they have the ILS approach in use for runway 24, and that's pretty much all that we needed to know. Okay, so let's start setting up for the approach then. Actually, we cannot really do too much of a setup yet, because as we can see, we've got an ILS frequency, we've got a radio to tune, but we don't really have any free nav radios. So, what I'm going to do is I will tune on the VOR number 2, the um, runway course as a reminder. Over, over, over fast. Okay. And we are just about approaching HUM VOR. Here's the next little formula for you guys. And that is the DME that we see up here is actually the direct distance between the aircraft and the station and 6,000 feet equals one nautical mile in other words when the DME indicates one point a bit while the um, altitude is just above 6,000 like it is right now then we are actually going to get um, going to be right over the VOR now Looking at the actual indications up here, it seems that what the GPS is showing us is actually the GPS distance to the VOR. So this is not the DME, this is GPS. But have a look at the DME on the right side here. While we are 0.8 miles from the station, we see 1.4 on the DME. And that is because our altitude comes into play over here. And um, if you are doing these kind of calculations, then just remember that one nautical mile equals 6,000 feet. So let's say, for example, you are at flight level 120 and you are immediately overhead of your R, but not yet inside the cone of silence. But that is a different topic that I'm going to explain in a moment. But let's say that you are not inside the cone of silence yet, then your DNP is going to give you two nautical miles while you are 12,000 feet above the station. That is quite handy to know when you want to determine the point where you need to start a turn overhead the station. And then of course this error gets less and less the further we are out from the station. The other thing, when you're flying very close to the station, you can see it right now, the uh, radial is going in and out. And that's because you have to make really small corrections. And of course, because I am still explaining stuff over here and not 100% focus on the flying as I'm trying to give you guys a little bit of information about what's going on actually. So we are now established on the radial outbound. We're going to proceed to 10 nautical miles, which is then going to be the waypoint Domek. And from there we are then going to set course southbound towards Dortmund uh, Wickedhof UR on the Domek to Alpha arrival. So first of all, cross to Domek, 204 degrees, let me just fine-tune this a little bit over here. And this is actually 204, very good. And then 10 nautical miles, so at 10 DME there we have our waypoint Domek from where we are going to start the arrival. Also, while we're flying outbound on the radial over here, we can already have a quick look into the um, Vicative VOR, see if that is actually alive. So I've just set it active, confirmed that we see the indications up here. Now, in the real airplane, at least in flight training, you would also listen to the ident of the VOR, which is the little Morse code that you see shown down here. But, um, well, 
let's put it that way, you do that in flight training, you don't do that after flight training anymore. Because you would just look that the DME and the radio that you see indicated are roughly what you expect them to be, and then you basically know that you are on the correct course. So let's look forward to the ILS approach and the procedure that we are going to fly. Seeing that we're a Piper 28, we are a category Alpha aircraft, so we are going to leave the KWR on the radial 069 until 9.7 DME from the ILS or 9.2 DME from the VOR. We are going to be using the VOR for that one. Then we make a left turn to join the final approach. In terms of vertical profile, we have to be above 3,000 feet at the VOR and then we can maintain 3,000 all the way until we are inbound. So let's go ahead and calculate our top of descent. We're currently at 7,000 feet and we remember from listening to the ATIS that the QNH is 1021. That means the difference in hectopascals is 8 hectopascals. So we can already pre-calculate the altimeter setting that we will have to use in a moment. But while you're doing all that, don't forget your um, navigation. So we are now at 10 nautical miles, which means that we are overhead Domek right now. So we'll start the left-hand turn onto the radial 350 inbound, which means we're going to set the course of 170. And as we can see by the raw data indication up here, we flew a little bit straight ahead while we reached the 10 miles, so we are just a bit to the right of the track right now, which is basically exactly what we expect to have. Okay, so let's go ahead with our calculations then. We said that for the descent, we need to go down to 3,000 feet, which means we have to cover 4,000 feet in altitude, and we are just going to use a very simple rule. 1,000 feet needs three nautical miles, in other words, for our descent, we're going to need 12 nautical miles to cover the 4,000 feet. Now, looking at the procedure, let's fly the inbound turn level at 3,000, because that is going to make our life a little bit easier. That means we have 9 miles outbound from Dortmund VOR, or from Vicodu VOR, to cover our descent. And then we have another 3 nautical miles that we need in order to... Um, cover the 12 miles. In other words, we are going to start our descent and leave flight level 70 when we are just about 3 miles in front of Dortmund VOR. Now, as I said earlier on, we also have to take the altimeter setting into account. Now, today with a Q&H of 1021, that is 8 hectopascals above standard, 1013 and one hectopascal equals 27 feet. Now make it 30 to calculate easy. 8 times 3 makes uh, 240 feet that we are going to gain on the altimeter indication as we set the local, as we set the uh, local pressure. Now that in my opinion is negligible, seeing that we have planned a level flight segment, so easy going. The last thing we should prepare is the calculation of what that is actually going to be in inches. So 8 times uh, 3 is going to give us um, 0.24 inches. In other words, our altimeter setting 2992 plus 0.24 is going to be what we need to tune. Okay, so that's pretty much everything prepared, and we are now three nautical miles prior to Dortmund VOR, so let's start our descent. We can see that we're showing a ground speed of 140 knots, so take that uh, times five, then you know the rate of descent that we actually have to fly, so that gives us something around 800 feet a minute. Also, as we do that, I'm going to reduce my power a little bit so that we actually stay around about on speed so that we don't have to do any changes to the vertical speed here. And yes guys, you are absolutely right, my tracking of the radial here is uh, not very good at the moment. That's just because explaining and flying at the same time is, uh, well, not that easy. 
Okay, so here's another example. The GPS tells us we are now one mile in front of Dorf in Indicative VOR. The DME, however, tells us 1.3, and that is exactly what I meant earlier on. The field elevation is 400 feet, so we are currently 6,000 feet above the field. 0.3 miles via the GPS equals one mile on the uh, DME up there. Okay, so we've overflown the um, VOR, so we can now set our outbound course over here, which is going to be radial 069. And if somebody of you is now going to say that I'm not flying this very accurately, then you are probably right, as said earlier on. Uh, a little bit too much explaining and uh, flying in the same. Okay, we are pretty close to the station, so I'm actually not going to use a very big angle to intercept the radial. Of course, we just need to find out what the wind is doing here, how the wind is blowing us, but um, we're going to get there eventually. Okay, so altimeter is set to local. And then we're looking at flight to 9.2 uh, miles. Which means we have five miles to run. And five miles equals round about a little bit less than uh, 2,000 feet. So we are at 5,000 feet right now, which is actually quite a good altitude to be at. Okay, it looks like we do need a little bit um, further correction to the left. And here the radial is coming. And if this actually was an exam, then make sure that you don't get more than half scale deflection, because that is the limit where you should be. Of course, in an exam you won't be talking that much, so things are gonna be a little bit easier for you. In fact, if this was actually a check flight, and I was talking as much as I am to you guys at the moment, then I would fail the check just for that. Okay. So now we are more or less on the radial again. Again, we're looking to fly to 9.2 miles, 7.7 .7 now, so we are slowly preparing for the inbound turn. A little bit high right now, but we still have the entire inbound turn in front of us. And since this is roughly a 180 degree turn, we basically know already that we are going to um, take about two minutes for it. That's why I'm really not worried too much at the moment about my altitude. So, pre-select the frequency of Dortmund Tower, 134175. And then 9.6 miles. Let's start the left hand turn. Now frequency triple 1.3. And the final approach for 239, let's set that one as well. So, in theory, when we're flying a rate 1 turn, we should end up immediately on the localizer. In practical terms, however, the wind is going to displace us, and the wind is probably going to displace us quite a bit. So, that's why we might just about have to fly an intercept heading, like a 270 or the likes, in order to actually establish ourselves. But here the local other seems to slowly come alive. As you can see, I've actually just rolled to about a 10 or 12 degrees bank turn, because that just makes life easier. And here the local other comes alive. Pulling the thrust off so that we can 
get our speed down into the range where we can use the flaps and then let's call tower. Doko Tower Low, Delta Echo Echo Mike India, established ILS 24. Delta Echo Mike India, Doko Tower Low, continue approach. Continue approach, Delta Echo Echo Mike India. Okay. And here we are. So, getting the speed down to about 100 knots. Glide slope alive. Okay, flaps 10. Okay, this is going to be an interesting one now because there is quite a bit of wind here at the moment and um, because things are quite rough. Just have a look at our crap angle over here. The runway course is 239, we're doing something like 260. That is almost a 20 degree wind correction angle that we have to the right over here. That's going to make things interesting. And the visibility doesn't seem to be that good either. Okay, glide slow captured. One very important thing here just, that just comes to my mind. Um, it is so natural for me by now that um, I didn't really think about it earlier. In private flying, as in VFR general aviation on single engine aircraft, a lot of pilots are using the pitch to control the speed and the power to control the altitude. We don't do that when we're flying IFR. We use the pitch to control the altitude and the power to control the speed. And the warning you just heard was the gear warning, so don't worry about that. So if you, if you try to use your power to maintain a glide slope, that's just not going to work. Um, that is by far not sensitive enough. So you will actually have to use your um, elevators in order to maintain the glide slope and then use your um, throttle in order to maintain the speed. That is the only way how you can fly IFR. I know that private pilots are definitely going to debate on this, but... Um, if there is one thing you learn in a flight school in uh, commercial flying, then it's that this is the way to do this. Okay, let's have a look. Ground speed, 84 knots. We're on a 3 degree glide slope, so 84 times 5 gives us our rate of descent that we should have to maintain the glide slope. So something like 400 feet a minute should work pretty well. Delta Echo Echo Mike India, runway 24, clear to land. Okay. With the 13902, That's quite a bit of wind there. So that is going to make this approach interesting.
And of course the turbulence of Microsoft Flight Simulator makes things quite interesting as well. You can see how much I'm doing on my control column here in order to keep the airplane flying. Okay, approach lights inside, straight ahead. But for now I'm really staying mostly on the instruments because um, that just makes our life a lot easier. So, let's slowly start bringing the power back. Gear down. I just really don't want to get too slow yet because we have such a strong headwind. I don't want to be flying for eternity. But there the runway comes. Look at that, ground speed 75 knots. That means in order to maintain the glide slope, we need 350 feet a minute. That just doesn't really feel right, does it? Okay. Flaps 20, that's going to stabilize the approach a little bit. Probably with full forward. Just look at what the wind is doing with us here. That's really amazing. Okay, watch the glide slope. We can do up to a thousand feet a minute but not more. And as we're back on glide, try to re-establish the earlier attitude and the rate of descent. And here we are. Note that the vertical speed indicator is not really a helpful tool. Um, the vertical speed indicator shows you everything with quite a bit of delay. So use your glide slope needle as a primary reference here. and not the VSI. Talking about the glide slope needle, of course, try to keep it in view. Okay, we're approaching minimum. Minimums. And... Yeah, that simulator just makes it really hard here. That turbulence is, uh, well, just unrealistic, honestly. But, for the sake of it, we're gonna keep trying. We'll check, please. Okay, power off. And we're down. Okay, here we are. Man, that was quite a bit of work to actually get it there. That was quite a bit of work. So let's see, we've got to let it roll all the way to Bravo, so I've just put a little bit of power on again. And here it comes. With one three nine two six one. With a one three nine two Delta Callback. Delta Echo Echo Mike in your welcome to Dortmund. Continue taxi via Bravo. Hold shot off, Mike. Continue via Bravo. Hold shot, Mike. Delta Echo Echo Mike India. Okay, that Delta basically means. Straight ahead and hold right of the first taxi away. With 
Okay, hold shot okay, on my. So basically, we are just so going to cross the um, cut two holding point here, and then we're going to hold shot right here. Via Mike and Delta, runway 24 holding point with one thing another two. Okay, we're down. So, flaps up, landing lights off, pedo heat off, and that's pretty much it already. So, I guess we're waiting for the Wizz Air on the uh, right hand side there. And once the Wizz Air is passed, the general aviation terminal is up there. So, that's probably where they're going to send us. Let's quickly get the, t the um, parking chart out. We are just about down here, runway vacated. So I guess we'll go via Lima to the um, general aviation up here, Lima and Kilo. Delta Echo, Delta Echo, Echo Mike, India, taxi to the general aviation terminal via Lima and Kilo. Taxi general aviation terminal, Lima and Kilo, Delta Echo, Echo Mike, India. So well, that's as expected. One three nine two. Report on the departure. Okay, clear right. One three nine two. Ready when reaching. And up to the general aviation park, and we go. So basically, straight ahead, uphill, and then on top of the hangar. That is where the parking is. That's a really fancy thing they come up with there. So that's something that we really need to do. Okay, that's the close taxiway. That's not Kilo yet. We just go one further. With 1392 fully ready. With 1392 with 240 degrees, one for North, runway 24, clear for takeoff. Runway 1, runway 1, 24, clear for takeoff with Then let's just put the plane all the way to the end on top of that hangar next to the other aircraft over there. Is that a TBM? I think it is. It certainly has a big propeller. Okay, I do think we fit in the middle over here. Clear right. And clear left. That fits over there. Perfect. And that shall be it. Okay, brake set. Avionics going off. Delta Echo Echo Mike India, thank you very much for controlling. See you next time. Delta Echo Echo Mike India, thank you for flying to Dortmund. Bye bye. Okay, the uh, 530 is the only unit that I cannot get off, so um, we'll just keep it at that. And then. We shut it down.
Okay, propeller, are you eventually going to stop? I think I broke it somewhere. Okay, we'll just imagine the propeller is stopped. And that's gonna be it. No GSX, we certainly don't need you. Okay, everyone, thank you very much for watching. Um, now, now that we've landed, um, have finally got a bit of time to answer your questions, so let's go ahead with them now. Um, and I'll start from the bottom to the top. So, um... Cosa, nice airport. Guessing by the ground markings, it's custom. Yes, it is indeed. It's from a Barometrics, Dortmund, Echo Delta Lima Whiskey. Freeware, and I can really recommend it. I mean, it's not up to the payware qualities that we otherwise know, but it is really nice airport, and um, it's free after all. Then Nathan, you purposely don't use the Navigraph locator arrow when you taxi. Why is that? Uh, that's basically because I have never operated anything in real life that actually had such a locator function on the GPSs. So, um, yeah, I've just never used it in real life, so I can do fine without it. Then, Dr. Deeple, will you stream raw data approaches and flights with the 737? Yep, I will. And GoCup1, Magneto on, you will leave. Yeah, good catch, thanks. I believe I put the two off and then jumped back to the right or something. But in any case, that shouldn't have an influence on the prop rotating there. That definitely shouldn't. With the fuel being off, let's just put it off here as well. There is no propeller windmilling in aircraft like these. I don't know why it's happening, but, um, well. Okay, then, um, going up a little bit more, um... Uh, Regix, am I using the Beta Flight Dynamic Configs for the Just Flight 28s? Makes a world of a difference. Uh, no, I actually didn't. I should probably do that for the next video. Because I do agree with you, the original flight model is quite outdated at this point. And Troza, just blows my mind that something fabricated by watchmakers can be so accurate if it's similar to its performance in real life. Yeah, it absolutely is. So, um... You know, even with steam gauges, you can fly airplanes to the same degree of accuracy that you can do in um, modern glass cockpit avionics. It really comes down to, you know, getting the feeling for the aircraft and getting used to fly the thing like that. So, um... This was my first PA-28 flight in quite a while, and I'm actually quite happy the way I could do it, even though there were a couple of points in there that uh, would definitely have failed me to check on this. But then again, it's been a while, so that is not that surprising. And Dr. Deeple, stream tomorrow? Um, probably not, no. Maybe the day after tomorrow. Um, but no promises on that. I have to make it fit my flying schedule somehow, because I'm flying 85 hours this month in real life. So that doesn't leave me with too much time, unfortunately. But we'll see. Next time we do the 737, we are definitely going to come up with something. And Nathan, flaps 20 is for the landing. Yeah, I used that because... Um, had I gone flap full, the plane would have uh, really been thrown around by the wind. And um, I just thought it flies very nice right now. And the plane is certified for flaps up landings. So I thought, okay, I'm just going to do it um, that way because it flies very nice. And uh, in these wind conditions, I'm just happy with it like this. Mario, can I do a diff video explaining the difference between holdings and racetracks? Uh, I'll think about that. Basically, holdings are, well, holdings, while racetracks are being used to lose altitude. For example, when terrain is a restricting factor, so when there is just no space for a straight in approach or for some kind of other instrument approach that could get you in position, then a racetrack is um, normally what's being done. 
And Dr. Dipple, I'm really jealous right now. Currently, I'm looking for a job as a first officer. Uh, have you tried applying for, you know, the big low-cost airlines and stuff like that? Um, sometimes they're just the way to go. Like, when I applied for the airline where I'm flying, you know, um, it wasn't my first choice particularly, but it, uh, they were hiring, they had bases close by, so that's really all that um, I could ask for for the first job. And here's a funny story. About a week ago, I actually had a flight as safety pilot with a brand new first officer. And the safety pilots are being used when a first officer really is new. Like he was doing his 14th and 15th flight on that day in the 737 ever. And um, so I just sat on the jump seat watching the captain and the FO to make sure that they don't um, forget something and stuff like that. And when talking with the first officer, he was like, hey, aren't you 737NG driver? Yes, I am. Hey, you are the guy who motivated me to actually apply for this job. That was, that was so cool. He, he was uh, one of the viewers on one of my first live streams. And he asked me about like, oh, would you recommend applying for these airlines and so on? And uh, I recommended him, yes, do it. And then I was flying with him on one of his very first flights. That was really, that was a one-time experience, let's put it that way. That was really a one-time experience. All right, guys. So, that's going to be it for today's live stream. Thank you very much for watching, and uh, I'm looking forward to see you all again on the next one. Hopefully Sunday evening, but I cannot promise that yet because there is quite a lot of stuff that I have to do. And uh, then on Monday I'm flying to the Canaries again with a rather early report. So, yeah, we'll see. We'll try to make it happen somehow. Anyway, thank you very much for watching, everyone. I'm looking forward to see you all again on the next one. Until then, enjoy the upcoming weekend.